The chief part of the Indians begin to plant their outfields when the wild fruit is so ripe as to draw off the birds from picking up the grain. This is their general rule, which is at the beginning of May, about the time the traders set off for the English settlements. Among several nations of Indians, each town usually works together. Previous thereto, an old beloved man warns the inhabitants to be ready to plant on a prefixed day. At the dawn of it, one by order goes aloft and whoops to them with shrill calls that the new year is far advanced, that he who expects to eat must work, and that he who will not work must expect to pay the fine according to old custom or leave the town as they will not sweat themselves for a healthy idle waster. At such times may be seen many war chieftains working in common with the people, though as great emperors as those the Spaniards bestowed on the old simple Mexicans and Peruvians, and equal in power with the imperial and puissant Powhatan of Virginia, whom our generous writers raised to that prodigious pitch of power and grandeur, to rival the Spanish accounts. About an hour after sunrise, they enter the field agreed on by lot and fall to work with great cheerfulness. Sometimes one of their orators cheers them with jests and humorous old tales and sings several of their most agreeable wild tunes, beating also with a stick in his right hand on the top of an earthen pot covered with a wet and well-stretched deer skin. Thus they proceed from field to field till their seed is sown. Corn is their chief produce and main dependence. Of this they have three sorts, one of which hath been already mentioned. The second sort is yellow and flinty, which they call hominy corn. The third is the largest, of a very white and soft grain, termed bread corn. In July, when the chestnuts and corn are green and fully grown, they half boil the former and take off the rind and having sliced the milky, swelled, long rows of the latter, the women pound it in a large wooden mortar, which is wide at the mouth, and gradually narrows to the bottom. Then they knead both together, wrap them up in green corn blades of various sizes, about an inch thick, and boil them well, as they do every kind of seethed food. This sort of bread is very tempting to the taste, and reckoned most delicious to their strong palates. They have another sort of boiled bread which is mixed with beans or potatoes. They put on the soft corn till it begins to boil and pound it sufficiently fine. Their invention does not reach to the use of any kind of milk. When the flour is stirred and dried by the heat of the sun or fire, they sift it with sieves of different sizes, curiously made of the coarser or finer cane splinters. The thin cakes mixed with bear's oil were formerly baked on thin broad stones placed over a fire, or on broad earthen bottoms fit for such a use. But now they use kettles. When they intend to bake great loaves, they make a strong blazing fire, with short dry split wood, on the hearth. When it is burnt down to coals, they carefully rake them off to each side and sweep away the remaining ashes, then they put their well-kneaded broad loaf, first steeped in hot water over the hearth and an earthen basin above it, with the embers and coals atop. This method of baking is as clean and efficacious as could possibly be done in any oven. When they take it off, they wash the loaf with warm water, and it soon becomes firm and very white. It is likewise very wholesome and well-tasted to any except the vitiated palate of an epicure. They have a great deal of fruit, and they dry such kinds as will bear it. At the fall of the leaf they gather several hickory nuts, which they pound with a round stone upon a stone, thick and hollowed for the purpose. When they are beat fine enough, they mix them with cold water in a clay basin where the shells subside. The other part is an oily, tough, thick, white substance called by the traders hickory milk and by the Indians the flesh, or fat of hickory nuts, with which they eat their bread. A hearty stranger would be as apt to dip into the sediments as I did the first time this vegetable thick milk was set before me. As ranging the woods had given me a keen appetite, 
I was the more readily tempted to believe they only tantalized me for their diversion when they laughed heartily at my supposed ignorance. But luckily, when the basin was in danger, the bread was brought in piping hot, and the good-natured landlady being informed of my simplicity showed me the right way to use the vegetable liquid. It is surprising to see the great variety of dishes they make out of wild flesh, corn, beans, peas, potatoes, pompions, dried fruits, herbs, and roots. They can diversify their courses as much as the English or perhaps the French cooks, and in either of the ways they dress their food, it is grateful to a wholesome stomach. Providence hath furnished even the uncultivated parts of America with sufficient to supply the calls of nature. Formerly about fifty miles to the northeast of the Chickasaw country, I saw the chief part of the main camp of the Shawano, consisting of about 450 persons, on a tedious ramble to the Muscoje country, where they settled seventy miles above the Alabama garrison. They had been straggling in the woods for the space of four years, as they assured me, yet in general they were more corpulent than the Chickasaw who accompanied me, notwithstanding they had lived during that time, on the wild products of the American deserts. This evinces how easily nature's wants are supplied and that the divine goodness extends to America and its inhabitants. They are acquainted with a great many herbs and roots, of which the general part of the English have not the least knowledge. If an Indian were driven out into the extensive woods with only a knife and tomahawk or a small hatchet, it is not to be doubted, but he would fatten even where a wolf would starve. He could soon collect fire by rubbing two dry pieces of wood together, make a bark hut, earthen vessels, and a bow and arrows. Then kill wild game, fish, and freshwater tortoises, gather a plentiful variety of vegetables, and live in affluence. Formerly, they made their knives of flint or split canes, and sometimes they are now forced to use the like in slaying wild animals when in their winter hunt they have the misfortune to lose their knives.